A very good morning to you, Nigeria, and welcome to another edition of What's Your Take? My name is Dayo Akintobi, and I'll be taking you through all the major stories that made the headlines last week. First, I begin by wishing all of Nigeria a very happy Easter, and uh, may the uh, reason for the season be made manifest in the lives of each and every one of us. As always, I have with me my trusty sidekick, Yetunde Afolabi, who will be reading out the news and telling us all about the major stories of last week. Yetunde, how are you today? Morning, Di. I'm very well, thank you. And how was your Easter? Did you have lots of free John and fish? You know, Good Friday, we're not supposed to eat meat as Christians. So uh, the meal of choice for Good Friday is something called free John. Do you know what that is and what it's made of? No, I don't. That's the first time I'm hearing it. So. Ah, okay, mm. interesting. All right, perhaps uh, we should go for some culinary lessons after the show is over. Anyway, Nigeria, I trust you're all having a lovely holiday weekend. This is a season of, of holiday breaks. Uh, Easter, there are two days uh, uh, of public holidays. Shortly after, there'll be another two days for Idel Fitri, which is the end of the Muslim fasting. Shortly after that, there'll be May Day which is Labor Day for workers, that'll be a holiday. And then after that, we're going to have the census, which is another three days of no work, which is a good thing for workers because we can sleep. Those of us who are salaried, nine to five, uh, paycheck to paycheck people, we can get extra rest. But employers don't like it, and daily paid workers don't like it either. So anyway, let's make the best we can of all the holiday seasons. And now in the news yesterday, or over the weekend, uh, Vice President Yemi Oshibajo uh, visited the Dia family to commiserate with them over the demise of um, the late General uh, Dia. And something struck me about what uh, the good uh, Vice President said. He said uh, General Dia proved there's life after public service. That struck me as rather poignant because guess what? The Vice President's tenure itself is run winding down now. And I'm wondering, was he looking at what his life will be like after he leaves office. He's saying there's still a whole lot more to life after you leave public service. I'm sure the good people of Nigeria expect to still see Professor Oshibajo being active in national, global, regional, and uh, diplomatic and all kinds of other affairs in as much as he seems to have acquitted himself quite admirably as the vice president of the country. So, sir, we look forward to still seeing you um, out there serving the public even after you've left office as vice president. All right. So um, the focus of our show today is on the security situation across the country. There seems to have been a bit of a lull when the elections were happening, but all of a sudden now uh, insecurity is rife all over again. So the focus of our show today is on, on the insecurity situation that's raging across the country. Lucky for us, our guest today is someone who can tell us a thing or two about security. Joining me to give his take on the big stories that made the headlines last week is Bamidele Ologundudu. Mr. Ologundudu is a retired Major General of the Nigerian Army. Welcome to What's Your Take, General. Thank you for taking the time out Thank to join us much. today. Thank you very much. Ah, brilliant. Uh, on a lighter note, let me just ask. The literal translation of your name from Yoruba to English is Black Warrior Ologundudu. Do you think you are destined to be a soldier? I mean, your name is so apt to the career you chose. Do you think that's destiny in the making that you more or less became a warrior in defense of Nigeria uh, uh, as a career, especially as that's what your name signifies. I think it's destiny because I wanted to be a doctor. Maybe you, you, you are aware of that. I was, and um, if, you, if I should tell you, I got a um, supplementary form to enter Nigerian Defense Academy, so it wasn't planned. I, I just took supplementary form because I had uh, my GCO levels then and I just saw a supplementary advertisement. Please, if you have your GCO levels, come and write your exams. And I went to write the exams, and today I'm a retired major general. So it was destiny 
not planned. Uh -huh. He was supposed to be medical doctor, planned. <laughs> <laughs> well, Destiny has a way of throwing us curveballs mm -hmm. on the best laid plans. Mm -hmm. So, Black Warrior, welcome to our show. Thank Yesterday, you. over to you. Don't dare call him Black Warrior when you address him. He's general. <laughs> Because the, no. army, the army. ladies have immunity with me. Ladies have immunity. Oh, you will make her from jump on the code. No, no, no. no. Like, oh, ladies have immunity. <laughs> ah, okay. All right. Here today, General says insurance covers you. So go ahead. Banditry and kidnapping. Business has resumed fully after a law occasioned by the elections. There's been a rash of killings, abductions, and general mayhem unleashed across the country in recent days. In Benue State alone, suspected killer herdsmen gunned down 87 people in Benue State within 48 hours, 34 of them in a nocturnal attack on an IDP camp on Good Friday. In Zamfara State, 80 children were kidnapped by terrorists, bringing the number of Nigerians kidnapped by gunmen to 333 over a six-week period. Gunmen and terrorists have also been responsible for attacks in Abuja, Lagos, Cross River, Night. Niger, Taraba, Rivers, Delta, Edo, Nasarawa, Kaduna, Kano, Ondo, Adamawa, Ekiti, Ogun, Oshu, and Plateau states. The burning question on Nigerian lips is, amid all this mayhem, where are our security forces? Where's the DSS? Where's the army? Where's the police? Perhaps your guests can help us better understand what is happening or not happening. Dio, over to you. General. Yesterday paints a really bleak picture of the security situation across the country. Things are so dire that government or, Governor Otto of Benue State told President Buhari ahead of the weekend that beyond cons condolences, he should go and fish out the killers of Benue people. Surely that must be a first, a governor rejecting the God president's condolences over the killing of the people in his state. How do you see this whole insecurity issue. I mean, IDP camp, internally displaced persons camp. These are people who are impoverished, who are dislocated, who are desperate, and you go there and you eliminate so many of them. What is fueling this insecurity problem? You as an insider in the army and a current consultant to the Nigerian Army Resource Center, can you give us an insight into what really is, is responsible for this insecurity in the country? Yeah. Um, I think it's a combination of bad governance, bad governance, and what I would call the inability of Nigerian police to function. Whether you like it or not, internal security, it's the job for Nigerian police. Until you restructure, re-equip, and retrain the Nigerian police to do its job, I don't think we are going to have a solution to this security problem. Um, I could see when you are listening, listing those who should be responsible, you, you first mentioned Nigerian army even before Nigeria police. <laughs> it's totally wrong. Mm -hmm. Where are the mobile police force? Mm -hmm. You must have an organization ready to confront violent crimes. Until you have that, they do it 24-7. The military is not supposed to do that. We are not the ones to do that. We can help. We can come in. But you need an organization 24-7 pursuing the bad guys, the violent criminals. And until you have that, you can solve Nigerian pro problem. The Nigerian police must be restructured, re-equipped, retrained to do its job. But General, um the homegrown terrorism we have nowadays, the terrorists we have, they carry sophisticated weapons, they have deep funding, um, they, they have the resources that they can marshal for major onslaughts. It's the Nigerian police who still carry ancient AK-47s, who don't have money to fuel their vehicles, who are not really trained in the type... I mean. Nigerian police, the way we see it as Nigerian public, is that they are for uh, enforcement of law and order, traffic control, investigating crimes like murder, local crimes um, that are within communities. But when you're looking at an organized effort like terrorism, an enemy you can't see, is the Nigerian police, isn't that why the, military, the, the army was called in? Is because it is beyond the capability of the Nigerian police to cope with? Well, I think uh, we are getting it wrong. 
internal security is a secondary assignment for the military. It's not our primary assignment. We can be called in to help, but once the situation stabilizes, we are supposed to withdraw. The truth is, it is the job of the police. They, and by the way, our police no longer carry um, dang guns and the type of guns you are talking about. They carry Kalashnikovs, just like my men. Mm -hmm. And the problem is their training, the ability to confront the robbers. Um, you, 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 can't, you can't fail to train. You can't fail to equip. You can't fail to organize. And you want to face robbers that are now organized, criminals that are now organized. Mind you, it's, a, it's, it's a more or less um, a business, a crimin criminal business enterprises we have in Nigeria. And that is why they, they are so organized. And you have their names, and some of them take ransoms, and they come, you know, in the open and talk. Do I hear you making a case for state police? Because you're talking about the fact that there needs to be a restructuring, that there needs to be re-equipping, retraining, all kinds of stuff. Are you alluding to the fact that maybe the power should devolve from the center in terms of security? Well, well, I, I, I always believe you cannot you cannot um, okay. protect my, my little village from Mondo State all the way from Abuja. It's, it's not possible. And it seems we have accepted, more or less, at least in theory, that we must have state police. But beyond state police, you must also have an organization or a force that should be able to confront the very violent crimes. I'm talking of banditry, kidnapping, terrorism, you must have that force. Within the police? Within the police, uh. or, or if you can't, if, if we know we can't go back to the mobile force, then we must go for an internal security force. Um, uh, President Babangida was trying to create National Guard, mm -hmm. and it should have been, what should have done that job, the National Guard. But we don't have it, we shouldn't be crying over split milk. So we should be talking about either the mobile police force stepping up to do their job or we create an internal security force one way or the other to fully engage the, um, the violent criminals. We, 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 can't, we can't just allow them to run around without a force dedicated to check them. Ah. So General basically puts it all at the foot of government and says that government needs to review the way security is structured in the country and perhaps for now uh, we can't really sleep with two eyes closed because at this point in time, the security architecture is the way it is. And we shouldn't really be seeing the army at polling units for elections, seeing the army at Lake Gate for NSAS. These are all things for the police is what General is saying. But until we get to a point where we structure our security architecture, it will continue to be the way it is. And unfortunately, that means insecurity will continue to rage. So please watch out for your families, your property, your life, and uh, stay safe out there. All right, Yetunde, what do you have next? The defense headquarters, DHQ, has condemned the clamor for an interim government by those unhappy with the outcome of the presidential election, stating that an ING is illegal and unconstitutional. The DHQ went on to warn that the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, has announced the president-elect, and as such, there can be no such thing as an interim government. Other political and social groups have also condemned the idea with the APC, the PDP, and the NNPP, all agreeing that the call for, the, for an interim government amounts to advocating for a coup, which is treasonable and unpatriotic. The House of Representatives has also dismissed the calls for an interim government, asking the DSS to arrest enemies of democracy. The Labour Party has however said that the military cannot interpret the constitution advising that the DHQ to avoid politics. A media aide to Peter Obi, the party's presidential candidate, Tayo Bassi, was quoted to have said that the military should stick to, it, to its defense role instead of striving to interpret the constitution for Nigerians. All yours, Tayo. General, as a high-ranking military officer while in service, 
you were privy to the thinking of the Nigerian army of its role in society. Should it stick to securing the territorial integrity of the country and avoid political issues? Or is it proper for the army to put its head inside issues that border on constitutionality, the way the DHQ is weighing in on this issue of an interim government? Well, the constitution is quite clear. We don't have any business with it. Um, Politics, even though we teach that um, politics is war by other means, and when you fight war, <laughs> it's an extension of politics. But um, the truth is we have no business in politics. Um, I'm, I'm proud of the leadership of the military now. They are capable, very intelligent officers, and they know what they are doing. I think um, they've said it. We are not interested. It is the job of the politicians. Let them do their job. I do think that is just the best way to put it. Do you see these calls for an interim government as tantamount to being a coup? And if that's the case, who can carry out a coup? Can the average ordinary Nigerian out on the street carry out a coup and impose an interim government? Who can do, who can make that happen? I, I, ju I just call it little nonsense. Little nonsense of Nigerian politicians. You know the problem. Um, is just personal interest. There is no interim government in the constitution. There is nothing like that. And I would not like to go into who can carry out a coup or who cannot carry out a coup. Uh, but I, I can tell you, I can tell you the military is a political. The military is ready to face its job of defending the country. We are not interested in it. I mean, I'm a retired officer and I'm, uh, I, can, I can tell you the, the the, of, the officers and soldiers wearing uniform now are on active service are intelligent to, to know not, that they should not be lured by politicians to doing what they are not supposed to do. And I think it has been addressed by the defense headquarters. We are not interested. Thank you. The Nigerian Army, a professional fighting force dedicated to defending the territorial integrity of the country and nothing more. General, uh, Alaji Lai Mohammed, uh, the Minister of Information and Culture, uh, last week uh, in the United States of America, essentially warned the Labour Party presidential candidate and vice presidential candidate that they should desist from the kind of rhetoric that they've been pushing out on the airwaves and on the pages of newspapers that they see as inciting. They are warning them that some of their claims amount to insurrection, amount to advocating an insurrection, and some of their comments border on the treasonable. This is all emanating from the fact or the incident of when Obidat, uh, da, uh, Baba Ahmed uh, Dati, Dati Baba Ahmed, the vice presidential candidate, went on air and essentially said the president-elect must not be inaugurated on May 29th because he did not fulfill the constitutional requirement, especially as it relates to the FCT. Now, um, legal minds have said that's up to the court to determine and not an individual. But he was very vehement in his claims that such an injustice must not be allowed to stand. Well, the government has warned him now that he's bordering on treason. What exactly is treason? And, and um, I remember treasonable felony in our law's time. I think that's very different from what's happening here. What is a treasonable offense? And uh, uh, are Nigerian politicians verging on treason? Well, um, Labour Party is a new kid on the block, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. They are sounding like just any other old pol <laughs> political parties, you know. When you lose, you start shouting and you start saying the... The, the building should collapse and things like that. I think um, when you incite people to go against the government, to overthrow the, the, the government of the day, then you are becoming treasonous. Um, they call for interim national government. It's not in the constitution. I don't know how we are going to get into that. I'll be interested in them that, you know, I would have loved them to tell me how do you form the interim national government and they back it up with the relevant um, portion of the constitution where you can do that. But they've not done that. 
I think the new kids on the block are just behaving like the old ones, you know, just um, the main thing is um, they are saying things that are just, you know, to their benefits and to their advantage and they are not talking about Nigeria. Maybe because you don't teach history again. Um, the last interim national government, you know, where it led us. Maybe because you don't teach history again in the schools, uh, even though someone said they've started again, you know. But I think if we learn from history, nobody should be talking about interim national government. It's not in the constitution. And we had a, a bad experience of it. So it's just the new kid of the block behaving like the old ones. Well, um, do, you think, do you think there's a double standard at play here? Because we see them, we see Alaji Lai Mohammed, of course, who's of the ruling party, taking on the opposition and saying the things you say. But we see some people from the APC also come out and say some terrible things publicly, even on TV, on social media. They've also said things that I would say is no different from what uh, that he's been accused of. So how, how is it morally upright if you have different standards for different players? Well, it's not good, but that was what I told you. We are, we are, I think some of us are, are talking about the um, Labour Party because, as I said, they should right. be the new kids on the block. And you expect them not to behave like the old politicians. Uh, if anybody from uh, the old group should say anything, I would just say, okay, that's the normal thing. But new kids on the block with the, with the obedience and <laughs> following them, I, I, I would love us. I would love we have um, new things coming up, you know, politics being something that we can all be proud of, you know, all those um, unnecessary things not being spoken again, you know, let us have politics. But if, if you are a new kid on the block and you are talking like um, um, a candidate in the 2011 and 20. 2001, I would say, what, then what's the difference? Mm -hmm. I think that's just the problem. Okay. Otherwise, well, all our politicians, that's what they do. So all upstarts need to go through a period of tutelage. Eh? They need to more or less uh, pay their dues and learn the ropes before they too can begin uh, bearing their chest like uh, the elder uh, statesmen politicians. All right. Yet today, we're fast running out of time. So give us our last story for today, please. Brain drain. A bill to prevent Nigerian trained medical or dental practitioners from being granted full licenses until they have worked for a minimum of five years in the country has passed second reading at the House of Representatives. The Medical and Dental Consultants Association of Nigeria, MDCAN, has however opposed the bill, demanding instead improved welfare for doctors. Over to you, Dial. General, our lawmakers are in the habit of running off abroad for medical treatment for even minor ailments. Is it morally right for them to seek to stop our medical doctors from seeking better fortunes in other countries? Isn't the ideal solution one where work conditions and emoluments of our medical practitioners, indeed all professions in Nigeria, are improved to the point that no one has to seek a better life elsewhere? Yeah, but let me ask you a question. Yes. Is anybody receiving good pay package. Are you receiving a good pay package in Nigeria? Well, it could always be better. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I said all professions. It's all not just medical. Yeah. It's not just medical and dental. All professions. Yeah. I, I think I, I would like to see them pass the law and let them test the constitutionality. I have a feeling it's going to fail. I'm not a lawyer. But the way I take the question of brain drain, as I've always told my friends, I think it's a phase in national development. It will come and go. Thank God that um, um, most of our rural areas are depend on Agbo and the rest. <laughs> but, but I think it's something we should, we should be careful about. You know, we should make our medical professionals and other professionals, you know, we should make them comfortable as much as possible within the limits of our, you know, coffers so that we can, we can give them the best and they give us the best. I wouldn't like anybody to leave because I'm poorly paid. If you say you want to leave because we are too many or things like that, or you want more training, I, I would like that better than what is happening now. But I still believe it's a phase of national development. We are going to get through this. India and Pakistan were once like us. I think our physics teacher then in Ibubi College was 
a Pakistani. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the general does not believe that the mass exodus of Nigerians to other climes is detrimental to national development. In fact, he thinks it's a relatively good thing. That, of course, hinges on them going to other climes, learning stuff, and coming back to play a role in developing our dearly beloved country. And that is the much we can take today on What's Your Take? I've been discussing with one of Nigeria's gallant soldiers who served this country meritoriously throughout his career. Thank you, General Bamidele Ologundude, Ologundudu, a.k.a. Black Warrior, for joining us on the program today. It's been nice being here. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you all for watching Nigeria. My name is Dayo Akintobi. We'll see you again next time. Have a great day and a superb week ahead. All the best.